Welcome to the Gibbs in the Bank Recruiting Podcast presented by BuckeyeScoop.com. This is the Thursday, October 1st, 2020 episode. I am Mark Givler. I'm joined as always by Bill Green. Um, we're going to be a little bit abbreviated today. We have a lot going on uh, with media availabilities and traveling for, for games and things like that. So uh, we're going to keep this around probably 15, 20 minutes today, but um, have a few things you want to talk about. Um, let's first kind of go into the news of the, the week or whatever, which is um, offensive tackle Zen Machowski, Ohio State target, decommitting from Louisville. I, I don't think that's particularly surprising um, given the heat Ohio State has been putting on there as well as some other schools who have jumped in on him. Um, you know, Bill, I, I don't think we're, you know, crazy here to think this is, you know, probably trending Ohio State's way. I mean, is that what, is that what you're, you're feeling at this point? Yeah, I kind of felt that all along. And I think you kind of made a great point probably on last week's show where you said there's no way Ohio State jumps in, publicly offers this kid and chases him hard. If they didn't know, they were probably going to get him. They would not do this as above board or not above board wrong word they wouldn't do this as publicly as they've done it you know to have that kid stay with louisville and embarrass the heck out of him so they've made you know this is this is pretty much out in the open and that tells me that you know they felt really good about getting him and then you know we had this week nevada buck put out there that it's a done deal and you know i'm not certainly not going to question him at this point so i i think all the signs are there that ohio state has their third O lineman in the 2021 class. Yeah. I mean, for me now, it's kind of about, you know, does this happen in the next couple of days or does he take a few weeks and maybe, you know, speak with some other coaches? I know what Florida state, I think Penn state, there's been a few schools have jumped in on him. Um, but it, it seems like it's just a matter of time at this point. Um, does this impact, you know, the offensive line numbers? Do, does this, you know, obviously Tristan Lee would still have a spot, but, you know, do you think this impacts the Ohio guys? What, what do you think happens now with, with this crop of Ohio guys are evaluating? It's just so hard to say. And I think the question comes down to, you know, at the beginning, they wanted four in this class and they did not want projects at all in any of the four. They wanted four studs. And at one point it looked really good that it was going to be Jackson and Chrisman and Latham and Burton. And they would have been thrilled with that, call it a day, move on. Well, then Latham and Burton went away. Now they're taking Michalski, who, you know, I, I, I hate to call him a project because there's so much negative connotation to that one. I don't think it should be that. But, you know, if he wasn't a project in their eyes, they would have offered him, you know, a while ago. So, do they look at it that way that just just cut the line here at three and then save that spot for next year or do they take another project with one of the ohio guys the guy the names we keep mentioning every week remac rodriguez rankle so and and my my thought is that they are probably going to wait on those three guys until they can get every inch of film they can get so, and there's no reason to offer one of those three tonight anyway. They could probably offer those kids the night before signing day and flip one of them. So, you know, that's the key question. Do they go three do they, or do they push for four? Yeah, I think now it's more on the kids than it was. I think previously it was like, look, they're getting to three. They have to get to three. And so regardless of how well these kids play this year, they're going to take one of those kids if they don't have three. Um, now I think it is, it's going to be more, the, the onus is going to shift to the player um, where they're going to have to really impress the staff. I think, I don't think they're going to um, take a kid just to take a kid at this point, um, assuming they get Machowski, which seems to be a pretty safe assumption right now. Um, so yeah, I think it changes the dynamic a little bit there, uh, but I do think they'll continue to evaluate those guys. I do think there's a very real chance they will add one of those guys to the class. I but again, I think they'll wait. We've been kind of saying that for a few weeks. We think they'll wait a while because they can. Um, there's, right. There's no pressure to make a decision on that today. No, uh, no reason to. And you know, Machowski, look, he is a project, and that's not a that's not a negative thing. Look, he he's probably put on what sixty pounds in the last oh my gosh. eighteen months, maybe even less than that. Um, uh, you know, he was two hundred and fifty two hundred fifteen pounds, not all that long ago. I mean, he, he's absolutely a project. That doesn't mean – I mean, God – And that's okay. 
Yeah, that's at okay. one point Jason Peters was a pro was a project, and he's going to be in the Hall of Fame in five or six years. So I mean, it, Eric it's Fisher, not... <laughs> Eric Fisher was a huge project. Eric right. Fisher was a project that Power Five schools ruled out that this guy could not play. He was first pick in the NFL draft one year. This is when we call Zen Machowski a project. I mean, to me, my connotation is, and I think fans sometimes misunderstand that that. You know, a, a project is the same thing as when I say, you know, someone can't play dead in a funeral parlor. No, that is not what I'm – this is not Tommy Brown, Antonio Underwood, or Chris Carter. And those guys were not even projects. Those were desperation heaves. So the big difference here, and, and if you're going to take a project, take the kid at 6'6", six, six, late developing, long arms. But for me to sit here and compare Zen Machowski to Paris Johnson is – it's disingenuous. I, I can't do that. But to compare him to Chris Carter and Antonio Underwood and Tommy Brown is ridiculous. So I hope that kind of clears that up. Yeah, I, I, I do think that's an important distinction is that we're not bashing him. There, I, There is potential. There is absolutely potential there. But again, we're talking about someone who's, you know, not played a, a, a ton of offensive tackle. We're ta- you know, has not, you know, really played a ton of big time football. So, and, and who, you know, again, was a different human being physically a year ago. So it, there, it, there's a lot of progression that's got to take place, but that has taken place. I mean, if he, if he, if he progresses in the next 12 months, like he has the past 12 months, I mean, wow, you may have something there. You may really have something there. So, um, yeah, I don't think we're um, writing him off by any means as a, as a long-term player. It's just, it is going to take some time, but right, you right. know, that's, that's the nature of the position, really. I it's mean, the, a lot of guys you, go through that. You work your board, and this is the natural progression. Nobody gets every kid they want. Alabama doesn't. You know, Clemson doesn't. And Ohio State doesn't. If J.C. Latham had committed back in February and Tristan Lee had committed a month ago, would they be looking at Zen Machowski? No. But you don't get everybody. Nobody gets all first, first choices. It just doesn't work that way. So, you know, I, I hope that kind of explains it better than sometimes when you when you write it on a message board, it doesn't come across as when you can explain it with your voice. And I hope people get the, you know, the designation here. Yeah. Um, you know, real quickly, we'll, we'll touch on this. I think we're going to do more on this next week once we get a little more uh, solid info on, on what's what. But um, Buckeye Bash, October 24th recruiting event uh, organized by the commits. I know Jack Sawyer is playing a huge role in this. Um, They're going to all try to get together on, again, on Saturday, October 24th. Um, Preliminary plan. I mean, details are being worked out, but preliminary plan. um, Go somewhere, get some food, watch the Ohio state opener together, go back, probably hang out at, at, at Jack Sawyer's house, do some, do some grilling or, you know, do a bonfire, play some games and just kind of build some camaraderie among the commits. They are obviously hoping that some of the uncommitted guys will show up. Um, I know Tristan Lee is a guy who they are trying to get to come in. Um, A guy that I keep hearing that there's some confidence with in getting him in is a Mecca Abuka, which I think would kind of, validate everything we've been saying about where that one's going for Ohio state and where that one has been going for Ohio state. Um, but you know, still, still, you know, details still being worked out. I think they're trying to put together a, an itinerary. They're trying, obviously you got to try and get some of these uncommitted guys to get in. Um, a large portion of the commits are actually expected. Um, so I, I, that should be interesting. I think a lot of the commits are going to be there. Uh, Bill, you know, we've kind of talked about this a little bit before, just not necessarily this specific event, but just the idea of these events, you know, and what they, what they really mean and what they really do for a team. You know, what's your stance on all this? I mean, is this a, is this a huge thing? Is it a nothing? Is it somewhere in between? Uh, somewhere in between. Um, when things are close, could the fact that a recruit is tight, with other guys in the recruiting class, could that push it over the top? Yes. If it's not really close, can the fact that the guy is absolutely bonded with recruits in a class, does that overcome the fact that he is not connected with his position coach or the head coach 
Not a chance. Not a chance does that help. So in recruiting, everything helps. And you take any advantage you can get, and I don't care what it is, you know, and you try to use it to your to your advantage. So to call this a nothing thing is ridiculous. If Emeka Buka shows up, that's amazing. Now, I think Ohio State already has him signed, sealed, and locked. And if he shows up for this, that means he's signed and sealed and locked even tighter. So better yet. Tristan Lee, I don't think they're getting it. Um, now, if he shows up for the Buckeye Bash, would that change my feeling on this? No, not until I hear that he's bonded and connected with Ryan Day and Greg Stradrala better, which I don't think has happened. I didn't feel it was that big a deal when Tristan Lee went to the Sooner Summit, and it wasn't. So, And I don't think it'll be a big deal if Tristan Lee ends up going to f- visit Florida unofficially, which I'm thinking could happen or hearing could happen. So. You know, could it push something over the top where there's a tie? Yes. Does it overcome the fact that your recruit is not connected with your coaches? No chance. So that's my thoughts on the the Buckeye Bash. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I think again, I think if a Mecca shows up, I think that's more of a sign of what a he of what he's thinking. I don't think him trying to word this properly. I don't think him showing up means that Ohio state makes this great leap with him during his time in Columbus that weekend. I think it means that's where he wants to go and he's just coming to bond with his future teammates. That to me, yeah. it's just, to me, yeah. it's more of a glimpse into where these kids are, what these kids are thinking than it is a thing that can actually completely flip a recruitment around. Um, obviously the, the elephant in the room is, is JT and I, you know, they're going to try and get him. I have not heard, anything either way that indicates oh he's coming or oh you know it's 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 there's no chance i think that's still a fluid thing um that one would be interesting because he has never been to ohio state and that would be at least interesting and kind of maybe uh, again we have speculated this kid's so quiet we have speculated for a very long time that ohio state leads i think that would be an interesting uh, piece of evidence that they lead um, if he uh, makes it out, but uh, we'll keep working on that. We'll probably talk about this more next week, but uh, I just want to hit on that real quick. Um, the kind of last thing we want to talk about real quick is um, the quality of play this year. Uh, Bill and I were talking about this before uh, we started recording and we've been to a lot of high school games. We're starting to watch college games. We're seeing chaos on Saturdays and college games, you know, sloppy up you know big upset sloppy play from supposed top 10 teams um i've noticed some of it you know i talked about this a little bit um after the ohio season opener where i i watched uh lakota west and Colerain, uh two of the state's top programs maybe two of the five or six best teams in the state and it was just a slop fest to me it felt like a scrimmage um i don't know that the play has improved that much i've been at one or two games where i thought things were pretty smooth but i've i've seen a lot of you know penalties and turnovers and all the line play doesn't look cohesive bill you know what do you what do you think about all this i mean are, are we seeing kind of the results of uh the the, the covet off season of just everyone being out of sorts i sure think so and i've talked to oh my gosh a handful of college coaches and when we bring up a specific player the, re- the response is usually, I watch this film, it's not good. And I'm like, I agree with you. And they're like, he's no better than he was last year. And I'm like, I agree with you. But is that because spring workout schedules were awful? Summer workouts were terrible. Uh, no padded practices, hardly at all. There's been very little instruction going on. There was so much Zoom stuff going on and virtual stuff going on no hitting at all, no scrimmages at all. So, I mean, I think it's going to be really tough in the evaluation process, for, especially for the 2022 class, because they were so underdeveloped. You know, they were just sophomores last year. And that, that year between sophomore and junior year, you can see such a big leap. But if the kids aren't playing and the kids aren't being individually coached, I mean, I, I think this is a year it's going to be harder to evaluate the 2022 class, the 2021s, I think we had a really good handle on them from last year from all the camps that we saw. We saw them play in person. I feel really good about how we think we're evaluating 2021. 2022 is really tough, and it's really tough for me. And 
not going to mention individuals here because it's it's we're being very general here. But in general, the team play has not been the quality's not been good. And then the individual play when you're popping in a huddle taper when you're going to a game to see little Jimmy and it's like my God, he's not any better. Well, is it realistic to expect him to be much better? I think this is the COVID year, and and it's affected just about every area of sports in our country. Um, Boy, college football has been really rough, like you said. So I, I think it's tougher this year with these 2022 guys, and I think they need to be cut some slack. I need they, they need to be given the benefit of the doubt. And I think most of these colleges feel the same way too. Um, it, it's going to be tough. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, this is just another fallout from a national or an international pandemic. Yeah, w- my hope would be – um, because I do think um, I do think coaches are going to slow things down a little bit and kind of try and get themselves into the spring evaluation period and all that stuff. I just hope we have that. That that's my hope. My hope is we have a full spring evaluation period. We have a full June college camp circuit, and so that everyone involved, from the kids to the coaches, can make informed decisions and can kind of get comfortable with each other. Because I. I sense very i just think coaches are so uncomfortable right now with their evaluations you're looking at tape it's it's oftentimes not great tape because of how really below average i guess the team play has been this year um because of the lack of practices together and things like that and i just yeah i i just hope we get to a spring evaluation period and we can get this all sorted um but yeah i've noticed it too it's it's just not been it's just not been as good as it usually is, and it, there's reasons why. It's not, it's not talent or anything like that. It's No, no, and I, I want to be clear on that too. You know, I, I think these kids need to be given the benefit of the doubt. They need to be cut some slack here, and I agree too with trying to get as much information as we can on these guys. And like I say, I, I looked at our original rankings, and I think they were probably – as poor a job as you or I have ever done before at this as I look at them now, but I, I don't know that I don't know how it could have been done any better. And then when I talk to college coaches, the real experts, the real geniuses in this field, and they're feeling the same way. So I, I kind of think everybody's in the same boat here. Yep. So hopefully, yep. Hopefully we get a spring evaluation period and some camps and continue to kind of piece this together because it is, it has been a little tricky. Um, but we're going to jump off here. Uh, we'll, we'll get what with you next week, guys. Hopefully have a little more on the Buckeye Bash, and we'll have some other stuff to talk about next week, maybe have a guest on. But uh, appreciate everyone listening as always, and we'll see you next week.